So let's move to the to the main conversation: um, the, the black public leadership and white liberalism, the, the case uh, for or against um, uh, Wendell Davis. And so, so anyway, this will again be a, a great panel, and again, we um, you know, hope you'll you'll stay with us as we uh, work through it. But um, LaShawn Anderson Banks will be moderator uh, with Sheila Huggins, Antonio Jones, and, and Millicent Rogers. Uh, and so um, it was mentioned earlier that um, by, by Katie, um, uh, some of my research um, that has been particularly surprising to me is that I, I, I do a lot of research around economics and looking at you know where the different races um, sit and where do they land as it relates to, to um, economic inequity. And, and what I found was something very surprising as I looked at these different gaps between whites and blacks and uh, Native Americans, Asian Americans and, and uh, Hispanics, uh, I came across an important uh, or you know, really surprising trend that the more um, you know, inequitable the place was, I, I found there was an association with it being a, a very liberal place. Uh, and, and that was very surprising because we often think about the idea that, that you, know, you have um, you know, liberal communities that's gonna mean um, kind of better outcomes uh, overall for, for um, particularly minorities and, and especially African-Americans, but I found that that's not the case. Oftentimes, that this inequity was driven um, not despite the actions of the local government, but because of the actions, and and this equated to a lot of times this idea of how capital was invested. Uh, it was invested with um, the white community to create wealth, uh, and created invested in the black and brown communities to, to kind of tie you further to social services, and um, and so that became kind of a very um, you know intriguing aspect of my research, and and, and it was very surprising to me. Um, the second thing that I found as I dug deeper is that, you know, there's a, you know, kind of this ongoing association between white liberalism and white uh, paternalism. And so uh, paternalism, if you, uh, you know, know, is this idea of policy or practice on the part of people in positions of authority um, to essentially, um, you know, restrict the, the freedom and responsibilities of those who are considered subordinate um, to them in the support supporting its supposedly um, best interest. And so that's one of the things that, that, that we found is that, you know, in these communities, there was often this sense that, oh, well, we're doing what's best for the black community or, 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 or the brown community, or whatever the case. And so it's not the same as traditional um, nooses and, and, and things of that nature or, or Confederate flags, but uh, it still has a very, very um, kind of suppressive um, aspect to it. And so, uh, you know, that was one of the things that, that, I, that I found. Uh, I wanted to look up this this context of you know an, an, an ally uh, versus a friend, and so I um, I, I found this on the news.com, um, you know uh, you know as it relates to, to white America and uh, and and um, you know the black community. So what is an ally? An ally is someone who is not a member of an underrep underrepresented group, but who takes action to support that group. It's up to the people who hold positions of privilege to be to be active allies to those with less access and to take responsibility for making changes that will help others be successful. The second thing I looked up was, is an ally a, a friend or an enemy? And, and what came back was a, a true enemy is always an enemy. Allies and foes are virtually one and the same. Allies, while they might appear as friends or not, they will work hard toward another person's interests as long as it serves their own, given the appearance of being a trusted confidant. So I found those definitions to be, to be pretty interesting and, and kind of take us into this conversation. Um, this conversation, conversation is taking um, place uh, in the heart of Durham and, and we're having this conversation in Durham. So I wanted to, to just kind of light very quickly to say, Durham is one of the most liberal cities uh, in the United States and it is the um, um, most liberal city in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, what kind of what data am I using for that? Well, Durham County uh, has been the strongest Democratic stronghold in North Carolina for the past three consecutive presidential elections. Uh, I found a quote that said that it was uh, partly driven by the highly influential People's Alliance and the large Black community, which make, makes Durham such a liberal stronghold. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, 78% um, of, of um, individuals in Durham voted Democrat. Um, another 4% independent, only 18% Republican. When you compare that to the triangle wide, which is the Durham Chapel, Durham uh, Raleigh Chapel Hill, for those who don't know, um, only 70.5% uh, voted Democrat across the triangle. And then across North Carolina, it was less than half. And so again, Durham has been a stronghold from a liberal standpoint. Um, in terms of, of the investments in that, um, Dems have raised 11 and a half times more gifts um, in terms of number of people given to the calls. Um, three and a half times more money have gone to the Democrats. Uh, in the most liberal cities in North Carolina, Durham ranks number one, Carborough and Chapel Hill number two and three. And these are 
communities associated with the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And so again, it, um, Durham as a liberal community uh, has the bona fides. So let's look at Durham by the numbers. It'll give you some context of, of this conversation we're having today and, and, and what it means. So this is another quote I found. It said, with a coalition of African-Americans, college students and highly educated whites, Durham was something of a perfect county for Barack Obama. Uh, and it also noted from a data that white fence plants, those that are moving to Durham also vote liberal as well. And so not only is Durham liberal, is getting more liberal uh, presumably as folks move in. Durham is about 322,000 people um, across the county. Um, that's, that's grown by 19% since 2010. So folks are st steady flocking to the community and, and we see it every year. Um, in, in North Carolina, Durham is the fourth largest city it's the sixth largest county and the 77th largest city in the United States. And so it, you know, it, it has some size to it. Um, in terms of the demographics, about 43% of the individuals in Durham are white. 37% uh, of those individuals are black, uh, around, right around 14% are Hispanic, about 5.5% are Asian and uh, right at 1% uh, is American Indians. Uh, we're a relatively, um, when it comes to median, um, a, a high, community, high earning community, Median income is about 61,000. Median simply means that half the population makes above that, half the population uh, makes below that. We're also a well-educated community, uh, meaning that um, the high school graduates, 88% um, uh, of the students in, in Durham graduate high school, and there's almost 50% of the people in Durham have at least a bachelor's degree. And so, uh, you know, it's a very educated community and the median age is right at 34, so right at that, that family age. And so this is the context of Durham that we're gonna be talking about um, today. So um, I want to move into this conversation and, uh, and then turn it over to the, the panel. And so right after I go through this, I'm going to invite the panelists. Um, but I want to go through some context for those who are in Durham and those who are outside of Durham. We have people watching this from all across the United States. We have people uh, watching this from outside of the country. So I want to give a, some context as to kind of how we uh, got into this conversation. Uh, um, you know, and, and some folks have said it's not about races, you know, and my Asked, really, I mean, let's, let's have this conversation. Um, you know, does race matter in Durham County? And so, um, you know, there's some context that happened before this, but I want to go through kind of a series of things that, that I think laid a conversation for this, uh, laid a foundation for this conversation. So in February 2020, um, so again, we're not talking a very long time ago, we're talking last year, um, County Manager Wendell Davis accused County Commissioner Heidi Carter of racial bias toward him and his staff of color. Um, that same, you know, immediately uh, Commissioner Carter came back and she called the accusations baseless. Um, a few months later, there have been a several several um, investigations to look into, you know, both um, um, Manager Davis's uh, accusations against Commissioner Carter, as well as it was an anonymous um, 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 uh, kind of fi uh, grievance filed against um, uh, Manager Davis uh, with the, the group that oversees um, county managers. And so um, in July 2020, Manager Davis um, it came back that he was cleared of any wrongdoing from the International City County Management Association. So they found that he, he, he had committed no wrongdoing by, by making um, the, the accusation. Um, a month later, um, um, James Coleman, a, 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 a legal uh, scholar associated with Duke University, released a report. And in the report, he said that um, Commissioner Carter's intentions were not racially motivated, but because of the fractured relationships, both Davis and staff reasonably could have perceived Carter's criticisms of Davis as racially biased. He found that the, the county board was dysfunctional and fractured. Um, in August 2020, uh, right at the same time, Commissioner Carter issued a writ written statement uh, for the public record saying the intensity of nature of the manager's words and actions have created a hostile and threatening environment which makes it impossible for me to engage in work where he may be involved in any way and she um, set out that kind of commissioner meeting uh, around the same time um, several organizations stood up and, and, and spoke out against this one called organizing against racism which is a multiracial durham coalition that asked for transparency and anti-racist public actions from the durham white commissioners um, around the same time, um, the county attorneys had suggested that racial equity training for the board be implemented. Um, at that time, um, then Chair Wendy Jacobs had suggested waiting until a new board was sworn in since the election already passed and uh, the, the county had um, actually um, um, voted in the, the first, as far as anyone knows, the first all women um, board of county commissioners in the, in the state of North Carolina, maybe beyond that, uh, and it included um, you know five county commissioners, two whites, two blacks, uh, and and the, um, the state's first um, elected um, 
Muslim um, 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 official. And so um, to date, um, you know, there's been a push by the current board chair, um, um, Brenda Howerton, to get some racial equity training uh, moved to, but um, you need three votes and there's three current board members who have, you know, kind of pushed against having that, that racial equity training right now. Um, go back to October, 2020, um, um, Commissioner Carter actually publicly apologized for what she acknowledged might have been actions that could have been considered racially biased by county staff and, uh, um, and county manager. But then, you know, we, we, we fast forward to um, a month or so ago and the People's Alliance actually released a statement and, and the People's Alliance, um, you'll learn a bit about them in a moment, um, calling for ending um, Manager Davis's tenure. And so that has, that really lays the, the context for this conversation uh, that we will have to, today, and uh, and all of this is public data, so it's something that that you know any of you can actually um, you know Google and research. And so uh, I will invite um, um, Lashawn um, the, to the to, to to come to the table, uh, um, Sheila, Antonio, and uh, Millicent to um, to come to the table and uh, and and start the conversation. So uh, thank you all for being here, and I will turn it over to you, Lashawn. Thank you so much, Henry. And thank you all for attending this event. Um, this is definitely going to be a very provocative conversation here. Um, so I want to jump right into it. Um, for Millicent, Antonio, and Sheila, I want you to first just give a quick, brief um, introduction about your organization, and then we'll take it from there. So I'll start with Millicent. Hi, I'm Millicent Rogers. I am a third generation Durham native. Um, I'm the co-president of the Durham People's Alliance and I'm excited to join this conversation with y'all tonight. Thank you. I will go to Sheila next. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sheila Huggins. I'm chair of the Friends of Durham. The Friends of Durham is a local nonpartisan political action committee that is focused primarily on Durham issues. Antonio. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Antonio Jones and I serve as the uh, 15th chairman of the Durham Committee on Affairs of Blood, which is an 86 year old social justice, civil rights and community based organization that centers our policies and our advocacy on the black experience of Durham residents. Thank you, Antonio. So I'm going to ask you a uh, uh, one answer question really quick, and we'll go in the same order. Are you for or against Wendell Davis remaining as Durham County Manager once his contract expires in June? I'll start with you, Millicent. The People's Alliance is for a race equity lens being put on tax assistance programming, on um, equitable funding for school capital needs, as well as equitable funding for school personnel. Um, we mm -hmm. promote LGBTQ plus discrimination protections and the role of the manager impacts that. So if he can't support those policies, we are absolutely against renewing his contract. Thank you, Millicent. Sheila. Thank you. Um, and I think since we're going to discuss this a little bit further, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but this time I'm going to say that the Friends of Durham is supporting the county manager and staying on. Thank you, Sheila. Antonio? Yeah, so we can get into the, to the uh, I guess, facts later, but um, the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People is for protecting employee rights that are being violated by uh, elected officials. So Wendell Davis is a county employee and we support him because of his uh, great job managing this county during his tenure. And we can get into the accolades and to the uh, awards later on, but um, in areas of fiscal administration, um, school finance and community enrichment, employee wellness. Um, so we are in support of a county manager such as Wendell Davis who continues to wanna to be held accountable and produce great results for this county. Thank you, Antonio. So let's now get into the specifics. Millicent, I'm going to ask you a question first. Um, so back in March of this year, the People's Alliance issued that public statement on counting and city leadership, and you seem pretty critical of Mr. Davis's leadership. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. We issued our letter on March 8th to raise critical issues and the city and the county were both hiring managers and their contracts were up for renewal. 
um, we were concerned about two major issues. First, the fact that the county manager Davis has slow walked progressive policy priorities and not putting back on the agenda the priorities that were identified by the commission, including, like I said before, tax assistance for long-time low-income homeowners and including um, the LGBTQ plus protections. Second, the language of the current contract provides for perpetual renewal, an extremely unusual clause that automatically renews the contract and includes a one year severance package. And so those are the issues that we were committed to raising with the council and the commission and hope that they would take those things into consideration as they discuss contracting those high level jobs. Thank you, Melissa. Sheila, why did the Friends of Durham respond with a statement referencing that the People's Alliance comment about Durham County needing to find a leader with similar political philosophy? Talk a little bit about that statement and um, why you think that's important. LaShawn, I'm actually going to read a little bit of the statement that we sent to the elected officials because okay. I think that, that would help provide some information um, for people who are actually watching. So we did send a letter on March 24th to the Durham County Board of Commissioners and the county clerk. I'm only going to read the initial um, introductory paragraph and then I'm going to jump down to our actual recommendations. So it says a letter to our elected officials. It's about our residents and not you. While a local political action group has put forth a public document advising you that it is the prerogative of elected officials to appoint a manager whose governing philosophy and leadership style mostly aligns with their own. Friends of Durham believes that it is the duty of our elected officials to appoint a manager whose governing philosophy and leadership style most aligns with meeting the needs of Durham's residents. In other words, it's not about you, it's about what the residents need and how our government staff can work to meet those needs. As you conduct your review of the county manager, Friends of Durham offers these thoughts. Number one, county managers are government professionals who serve in executive administrative roles that include managerial and operational duties. Appointed managers are nonpartisan and nonpolitical. They are not political operatives or political hacks. Number two, the review of a county manager should reflect the manager's work plan and meet the goals of the work plan. The manager's compensation package should reflect the manager's experience and responsibilities. When descriptors like lame duck commission, numerous perks, hefty monthly vehicle allowance, and massive severance package are used as political clickbait to garner your attention and influence your review of the manager, you are obligated to stick to, the, to evaluating the manager based on the manager's work plans and records. Number three, the International City County Management Association has provided a code of ethics to guide the conduct of city and county managers. Those tenants say that managers serve the best interest of the people. And although managers work closely with elected officials, they should also refrain from all political activities which undermine public confidence in professional administrators. Our residents are counting on you to govern in a way that puts them first. This means that our residents are the ones who need to matter, all of them. And we felt that it was important to make sure that our elected officials were reminded of these four, these three, ideals when we um, responded. Thank you so much, Sheila. I have a question for you, Antonio, and I can see that our chat box is lighting up with some very pertinent information that I want to incorporate while we're talking. Um, but Antonio, the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People came out with a statement that did not only reference Mr. Davis's situation, but it said that you stood with all county employees and you talked a little bit about that with the support of employee rights. Why was that the framing of your statement? I think it should be noted. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. yes, yes. Okay, I think it should be noted that we gotta separate out the, the roles and responsibilities of a county manager and the roles and responsibilities of the elected official. Those are two completely different roles. So I think 
st to start this conversation, some distinctions should be made to ensure that we're talking in, in the right pace. But to answer your question, the Coleman report that was referenced earlier um, that came out in August of uh, 2020 and July of 2020, other employees are impacted by the actions of the county commissioners, right? So our letter talk about the broader um, experiences of, of the county employees at the hands of elected officials. So on March 8th, the public seen the blatant disrespect that the county commissioners showed towards black co contractors that were hoping to do business with the city or the county and employees who they continuously second guess, right? So those are the things that were found in this report. You know, the constant pattern of desperate treatment towards employees of color, creating a, a toxic work environment, the racial and sensitive language used by some of the commissioners, the micromanaging, the lack of trust in black professional employees as alluded in the first panel. Um, and as of last night was another prime example, you know, how they use an outside law firm. We have an entire legal apparatus in our county government. They voted to go to an outside law firm for a contract review when we have highly qualified legal team that are county employees. So that's another example as illustrated in this report, how they do not trust the black professionals in Durham County government. So we put our letter out to stand in solidarity with all county employees, not just Wendell Davis. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, I wanna jump to one of the questions in the chat here that says, don't the residents express what they want and need from county government by electing the board of commissioners? We don't get a direct vote on the highest paid, most influential employee directing the county's business. We can only act through the commissioners. What are y'all responses to that? Because someone else wants to know why are we talking about the job of one wealthy man whose future is quite assured regardless of his tenure rather than the failure to fund repair of crumbling schools and provide social work first to students. The singular focus on the manager rather than on pressing issues that affect black and brown communities smells of protecting the wealthy rather than doing what the poor need. So the PA laid out clearly in our statement that the expectation is that the manager is going to put um, the values that the commissioners request in front of them. And so, I mean, even now we can speak to the fact that the budget retreat information hasn't been presented to the county commission. Um, and so when he slow walks their processes by not bringing them the information that they need to make the votes that the Durham residents need, then we have a problem. And if we go back to that same Coleman report that everybody keeps referencing, the Coleman report also says that a majority of the commissioners were unhappy with the slow walking of initiatives from the county manager. We can't leave that part out. Sheila Antonio. LaShawn, well, I'll speak to the part about um, electing county commissioners. One of the things um, that I think Henry touched on was this idea that Durham is very liberal. And one of the things we have to think about is who shows up when it's time to vote. We still have a very low turnout overall. And so one of the things that is incumbent upon county managers is to not just think about who shows up at county commissioner meetings, who has time to send them emails, who are the ones making the phone calls? And so a lot of times you do see our county commissioners out in the community among the residents, listening to them. And so it's important not just to say, oh, well, we got elected and these are the people who were showing up, but it's incumbent upon them to actually be out in the community and seeing what people are saying. Not everybody has time to go to a county commissioner meeting or even look at it at a Zoom now. People are still trying to get over COVID. They're working two and three jobs. They have children at home that they are trying to teach and they're not teachers. And so it's so important for us to remember that we can't just think about one way as being the way that county commissioners get their information and that it's important to think about all of the residents. We have over 300,000 residents in this county. All of them did not vote. And so we do have to recognize that there are some voices that are not being heard for a variety of reasons. And we need to make sure that we're still listening to them and valuing them. Thank you, Sheila. And if I can, if I can add in. So 
prior to my current profession, I worked in Durham Public Schools. So I've man actually managed school budget. So I think we have to start telling the truth as it relates to education funding in Durham. So since the merger of Durham City Schools and Durham Public Schools, we've never had an honest conversation on funding, nor our facilities, right? So I think if we go back and let the record reflect and let the record show, what you're gonna find is that there hasn't been, prior to this current administration, there hasn't been a comprehensive plan to deal with our schools facilities wise. What we done was we had bonds and we did these wish lists and wrapped them up into a bond as opposed to a long-term strategic plan. So under this current leadership, Dr. Mbinga using the Cummings report, that is our long-term plan. It's in the chat box. What we have found is that we have some crumbling buildings that's been crumbling for a long time. We have schools that are over 100 years old that we are still using today. What we found in facilities are, once your facility gets above 40 years, it's gonna start deteriorating really rapidly. So for example, DSA, Durham School of Arts, that main building is 100 years old. And we are set to put $80 million in construction needs and renovations into a 100 year old structure. So the, the honest conversation is, some of our schools need to be torn down and rebuilt. Okay, so now the other piece of it is back in 2007, there was a conversation at a school board meeting where Steve Shue, Heidi Carter, and then Superintendent Carl Harris talking about our um, school funding, talking about our facilities. In 2007, 14 years ago, they talked, they warned us about what was going to happen today. Since then, there was no comprehensive plan until that Cummings report. So in the chat, if you click on that link, you can read the minutes from that meeting, right? So now, the county manager, what does the county manager have to do with this? Of all of the needs that Durham Public Schools have, it has to be a policy or a directive in front of the county manager, regardless of county, to move forward with those things, okay? So now, the capital improvement. What the financial analyst for the county has said is that we didn't do it in a comprehensive way to include school buildings and county functions in a way that is a cyclical process that you're doing repairs. That's the standard fashion. So in terms of creating these Christmas wish lists that's wrapped in the bonds, that's not the most appropriate way to handle it. Now, that's what the experts said. We can get into that later, but I think if we have a conversation about school funding, we can have a whole separate conversation on that. So um, I think that answered your question. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, can I, can I yes. add one other thing too? I don't think we can have a conversation about school funding without really talking about the system that we have in place, because mm -hmm. that really is the issue, the way that schools are funded across the state of North Carolina. And we just cannot forget the Leandro versus state of North Carolina case, where we are looking at black counties across the state that have been underfunded. And we have a system where yes, counties are paying for these buildings, but already they're never going to be in a place to be able to pay for them in a way that they need to be paid for. So we need to go back and change the whole way that our school systems are funded across the state of North Carolina. This is not something that is only a problem in Durham. This is something that's a problem for all of our public school students. Right, and I'll say this last point. We have to remember the county commissioners set the policy. So you have to show in public record where the county commissioner voted to give the schools whatever they wanted, whether it was $200 million, $50 million, $6 million, $1 million. That's a policy decision. The five people, five, make that decision. The county manager implements that. So for all the shots that are taken at the county manager, show me a policy by the county commissioners to say, Mr. County Manager, please implement this policy. So I think that's part of this conversation that's lost. Understanding the role between the county commissioner and the county manager, regardless of the county. Because this, this is kind of how it works across the United States. Thank you, Antonio. Millicent, I wanna to get to you with a question, but we have one in the chat that is directly related to what um, Antonio said. Um, the county has more responsibilities than just school funding. The county manager does not set the agenda, like you just said, um, for the consideration he follows the lead of his employer and the five county commissioners. With that said, why does the People Alliance think that they are the employer of the county manager and that they have a say so in continuing or not as a Durham County manager? Now that, that is a loaded question, Millicent, so please add all the context in there. So our letter addressed the county commission. 
It didn't address the county manager. And uh, none of this would be public if his letter last March didn't go public. If he had filed his grievance through HR with his employer, just like Marquita Welty in 2017, then this wouldn't be a public conversation. Melissa, I'm going to stay on you for a moment about this. Um, so we know that the county commission is a board of five women, two white, two black, and one Muslim American, the first woman of Muslim descent to serve in public office in North Carolina. And, you know, some believe that the People's Alliance worked with, the with Heidi Carter and Wendy Jacobs, the two white commissioners, to craft your public statement to offer cover to replace Mr. Davis. Um, but then some folks also question that why is you, as the Black co-president, have been the only face and voice of this debate, even though the People's Alliance has a co-president model and have pointed out that your white co-president has not spoken on this topic. How do you respond to those? So uh, we didn't work with any elected officials to craft our statement. Okay. We worked with the PA board to craft the statement in the same way that we craft other statements. Um, we do use a co-president's model and um, all the inquiries, including the invitation from Dr. McCoy were addressed to me and I've responded because I am able and willing to represent the People's Alliance as a co-president, which is what I was elected to do. Thank you, Millicent. Let's see here. Um, let me ask this one question too. Isn't part of the problem in this dispute the claim that the manager is not faithfully implementing the policies passed by a majority of the board? Is that for me? It's for anyone. But repeat the question, please. Isn't part of the problem in this dispute the claim that the manager is not faithfully implementing the policies passed by a majority of the board? If if that was the case, I think that'll be grounds for termination and insubordination, mm -hmm. uh, because the role of the county manager, regardless of county, the role of the county manager is to do exactly that: faithfully implement the role, the, the uh, policies of the governing body. And I would clarify that the PA hasn't requested that Mr. Davis be terminated. Okay. We've requested that his contract not be renewed because the termination of his contract, the way the contract is built right now would require, when it's not in the renewal period, would require a hefty payout of taxpayer dollars. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Sheila, I want to ask you a direct question, a little provocative also. So some folks have stated that um, the People's Alliance statement contained a lot of dog whistling in it, and that some statements evoke certain signals, emotions, or responses from the white community, such as alluding to the idea that his tenure was illegitimate from the start because of the previous board had approved his contract had been majority Black, and that he made too much money or had too many benefits, or that he could not be held accountable without removal. Others say that the People Alliance has always been a friend to the Black community and that that dog whistling was unfounded. How do you respond to that? Thank you. I think, you know, one of our main issues that we had was the way that the statement was crafted. And typically, if you look at what goes on in the non-liberal community or the conservative community or the Republican community or whatever label it is you want to throw on it, when they use dog whistles, we get upset and we point it out and we say, no, that's wrong. You know, you're using those words and phrases to arouse fear in a group of people. And it really is just a call to action to create a certain outcome that you want. And when we do it in the progressive community or the liberal community, we sometimes feel like it's okay because we're wearing it, you know, that badge of progressivism that's supposed to be okay. And it's really not. I, you know, if we don't want to call it a dog whistle, then call it a cat whistle. You know, it's a little sneakier. We think it's okay, but it's really not. 
it still demeans a person to sort of say, well, you were elected by a lame duck commission. And so that somehow means that you are not really legitimate because you should have wait, they should have waited until the new commission came on board. It was the same sort of tactic that was used to deny President Obama his rights to appoint a federal judge to Supreme Court, you know, and yet we cried and we got outraged about that. And we somehow say, but when we do it on our side, it's okay. Well, it's not, it's just not. It's just as insidious, it's just as harmful. And so I think sometimes we have to do that self-reflection to our organizations and to ourselves to sort of say, hey, wait, aren't we sort of doing the same thing here? Let's take a moment to rephrase and talk about exactly what he was doing in terms of his work that we did not agree with instead of using these phrases to somehow shift the conversation in another direction. Thank you. I'm going to do a follow up with that that was posted in the Q&A. But I see that the chat is blowing up. Please make sure that you put the question in the Q&A because that's the only thing that I'm looking at. And it may be some good conversations happening in the chat, but make sure it goes in the Q&A. Um, and Sheila, you were talking about um, his performance. It, this question says, how did the allegation against Commissioner Carter become a matter of the performance? Where were the documented qualms with the county manager's performance before he addressed the racial biases of Commissioner Carter? I'm sorry, state that question again, because there were like two parts. <laughs> okay, um, how did the allegations against Commissioner Carter become a matter of performance? Where were the documented qualms with the county manager's performance before he addressed the racial bias of Commissioner Carter? Which seems to imply that the performance was not the issue. Right. And so, again, if we go back to how that all sort of started, you know, he was talking about the mistreatment that was going on that he was feeling. And again, let me point this out, because this was something that Antonio said earlier, that this is not really just about him and that we have to understand what this does to a group of employees who now say, well, hmm, maybe I don't want to speak up. It's the same thing that Shauna Lemons talked about and that Lisa Jones talked about. You don't want to come forward because you see what happens to this other person. And so if it's if it's about my performance, then let it just be about my performance. But you don't have to speak to me in a way that has racial undertones. Mm -hmm. And that was some of what was going on. And so then we have this grievance that is put forth. And what becomes an issue at that point is, well, not let's look at the grievance and see if there is some basis there, but well, let's now look at how you sent the grievance and talk about what you did wrong with that. So there's a whole sort of analysis that goes on. And one of the things we have to think about in terms of what the response was from Ms. Carter, it was, oh, I didn't intend. And so a lot of times we hear that because people think that racism requires intent. It does not. The first thing that should come out of your mouth is, I am sorry. And so there has to be this sort of understanding that I had, I actually need to listen to what the other person is saying. There was a book that Edward P. Jones wrote a number of years ago called The Known World. And there was an example in this book where one student hit another student. The student who was hit said, that hurt. The student who hit the other student said, well, I didn't intend to hit you. I know that didn't hurt. And one of the things that the teacher said was, when you're hurting someone else, you are not the one who gets to determine whether or not you harmed them. They are. Thank you, Sheila. Before I get into another question, something popped up in the Q&A that we shouldn't only ask Millicent about crafting their, her statement or the People's Alliance statement. Um, Sheila and Antonio, did you work with any commissioners to craft your statements? I did not work with any commissioners to craft my statement. As far as the Friends of Durham is concerned, as chair of the Friends of Durham, I typically am the one who crafts the statements. I bring the statement back to our steering committee. We review it, we make changes, and then the statement goes out. Thank you. Antonio. 
Uh, no, we did not work with any commissioners to craft our statement. We have a, uh, a team of highly educated people that can craft a statement about any subject matter. Um, but I'm going to go back to something, okay. if I can. You know, so I'm glad you quoted a book, Sheila. So in this book, uh, Dr. Carol Anderson, White Rage, right? She's a professor down at Emory University. And based on some things that were said today during this discussion, I think this point is relevant. The trigger for white rage inevitably is Black advancement. It is not the mere presence of Black people that is the problem. Rather, it is the Blackness with ambition, with drive, with purpose, with aspirations, and with demands of full and equal citizenship, right? So as we hear stories and read in the comments about this wealthy man, he's a county manager. You know, county managers make money. That's what they do. The notion that a, a, a self-proclaimed progressive organization would say that, well, he makes too much money. What, failing to do a comparative salary analysis, right? So all of the perks that are in the contract they, that they outline, when you do a comparative salary analysis with other county managers, other top administrator, even some of these nonprofit executive directors in Durham, what you're gonna find is they pretty much are in line. Also, when you put certain perks and contracts, those are used as recruitment tools, right? So I think that's some of those distinctions that we should be able to make. But what I would say is this, the thing about liberalism and progressive policies, see, see people have used this social justice thing as this uh, a philanthropic gesture, right? So are they really about impacting lives or do they want a pat on the back because I have a Black Lives Matter sign in my yard? Do they want a pat on the back because they have a what? They change their social media avatar to Black Lives Matter or they support George Floyd, right? So right now, these are real world issues impacting real people, right? So the county employees have been under attack for a while, not only Wendell Davis. So if you are a champion for equity and race equity, you have to first understand how white supremacy work. You first have to understand how systemic racism work and you have to understand what's your role in that. Either you for it or you against it. See, this is the moment in history right now to where you can be with it or against it. So it's not about just one item. All of these things work in circles. The police br brutality works in a circle, right? The insurrectionists, all that works in a circle. White supremacy works in a circle, right? The notion that you're saying he's, he's wealthy. If he was, question, if Wendell Davis was a white county manager, would that same tone would have been used? Would that same language would have been used when the previous white county manager that was here for 14 years made more than Wendell Davis, but I don't ever recall the PA reference in his salary. So all of those things have to take it into totality to understand your role in oppressive tactics. So, Millicent, you look like you wanted to unmute. I did want to unmute. I want to say we named his salary. We didn't assess his salary, right? We assessed the, the additional perks, as uh, Mr. Jones mentioned. And part of the problem with the perks is that he was already a, a county manager. He didn't need those perks in order to incentivize him to come to Durham, to remain in Durham. And that's okay. But the issue is not the perks. It's the tying of the next board of county commissioners hands with an inability to part ways with the county manager that they clearly from the Coleman report had issues with his job performance with how he was bringing their issues to him, to them, right? They were disgruntled, they were upset about him slow walking their policies. And so they couldn't separate themselves without harming Durham. The salary is not a, the issue. Okay, well, I think if, if, so, 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 well, I think if the, the, what your, your point you're mentioning is the issue with the schools when you're talking about slow walking at the, in the Coleman report, well, I, and, is, is and that what you're referring yes, to? He's slow walking the issue and the tax assistance grants to combat regentrification and allow black and black and brown people who've been here forever to remain here. Right. right? And those I, are the issues that we're talking about. Okay. So if I can just take both of those. So the issue that you're referencing in the Coleman report, Commissioner Ellen Reckow confirmed that he was not the um, issue for slow walking it. They did not receive the information from Durham Public Schools. So that's actually listed in the footnotes of the report, right? So we can't blame the county manager when the school system didn't provide what they were supposed to provide, which was confirmed by a county commissioner. All right, so that's one piece of it. The tax assistant piece, 
it has issues, right? So the legal team has problems with it. It's been vetted by other attorneys, right? The school of government has looked at it, right? So at the end of the day, here's the key. That's a policy. That means that fell on the commissioners. So once again, you have to understand the distinction between a county commissioner and a county manager. Any policy issues that you may have, you have to take that up with the elected officials, whether it's a school related issue, whether it's a city related issue or a county related issue. Policies are for the elected officials. Implementation is for the administrator. Okay, I do have two, two items in the, in the Q&A that kind of tie in with this conversation. Um, and um, Antonio, please feel free to respond to this. Um, how does it make good management sense to have a contract with automatic renewal especially if there's no formal performance evaluation that measures the success of the employee in executing the requirements of his office. And then there's um, someone said that the issue is not just a lame duck commission appointing Wendell Davis is that they gave him a contract with unprecedented protections that made it impossible for the newly elected commissions to fire him for the entirety of their term without paying him a huge settlement and that the audit and that it automatically renews. Do DCAPB or FOD support all managers getting these kind of lucrative contracts? And I can reread any part of those statements, but I, I do want you all to respond to that. So I'll respond first. Um, you know, we have been in a system for a very long time that has based a payment on salary history and what you did before, and where you came from. And so those sorts of things would automatically take into account times where you may have taken a lower job because you had gotten laid off before, or a time where you may have moved to a smaller city and got paid less. One of the things that we would like to see is people actually getting paid what they're worth for the work that they're doing. And at this point in time, we still see a lot of disparities between gender, across races, even geographically within the same city, people doing the same work. And so we have to be concerned in terms of how we talk about what somebody's value is, what they're bringing to a position. And yes, there are ways for us to look at comparative jobs. And one of the things we had a concern with was a statement that his, his pay was not in line with other employees in Durham. And so what we're talking about is looking at other county managers who are in a position that he is and has the responsibility level that he is. And so I think we have to be careful when we just make general statements and that we don't take the time to actually look at that person, the experience that they're bringing, what they're coming in with, what they're going to be doing, and actually doing a comprehensive evaluation of that. It's just really concerning. It just really is when we use some of this language that is not specific, but it's just designed to make it look like it's wrong without going into detail. And that was just a really big concern of ours. Thank you. Do any others want to respond? Or we should keep it moving with the questions. Antonio, you're unmuted. Uh, well, I agree with what Sheila said, but I think it's have to be known. Um, since the contract was brought up, a comparative analysis would have been great because then you can compare apples to apples or at least get like words. Um, if you have a problem with some of the provisions, the then county commissioners agree to it. Now, if, if you have a problem with some of those provisions, that's calls for a renegotiation of a contract, right? But I think as Durham County employees are seeing the good things that are going on in Durham, right? and you start looking at what's going on and uh, you look at the metrics, job performance, you have to ask yourself, is it performance-based, politics, or personal? When you have a county manager that's well-respected amongst county managers, right? When you have cities who would love to have some of the metrics that Durham County has. We have counties that would love to have some of the metrics that Durham County has. You have to start asking questions. What, what is it something else besides job performance? Right, and that's that's a basic question for anyone, regardless of your race, you know. Um, but you can go to your next question. I'm sorry. 
and I know we're we're cutting short on time, Henry. I want to make sure that I'm respectful of everyone's time because we do have some really great questions in the Q and A. Um, but I know that we are getting right to um, time here. I, I do want to ask this this question of you, Antonio. The People's Alliance stated that the county required progressive manager with the focus on equity and pointed to the LGBT. BTQ plus policies have been an example of why a new manager was needed, but you pointed out something else in the role of the county manager versus the county commissioners. I guess you were saying more of who sets policy and who implements policy. Was that the point you were getting to? Right. So the LGBTQ reference actually came out of the People's Alliance statement. So I don't, I'm not clear what they were talking about, um, but it was a policy related um, item that's an item for the elected officials. Mm -hmm. It's a policy related item. It's not a county manager thing. So anything related to policy, that is a item for the elected officials. So I don't know if Millicent wants to give clarity or context to, to specifically what is she referring to with the LGBTQ uh, policies? I, I, I don't know. Yes, so our statement is truly about policy issue across the board. And the People's Alliance and myself are here to advocate for working class black and brown residents. Mr. Jones said the point of the county manager is to make money. My people need to make money. People need tax assistance. People need schools that are fully funded, not falling apart. And Mr. Davis is not doing that, just like he has not allowed the LGBTQ provisions to go in front of the county. He has not worked with the county commission to get that on their agenda. So he's slow walking these things. And therefore, it's time for his contract not to be renewed. So, so Millicent, who sets the agenda? The, the board chair and the uh, county manager work together with the vice chair to set the agenda. Okay, so are you suggesting that they that he specifically said, no, I'm not doing it or I'm well, telling me- I think, I think what happens is we have things like, he wanted to add three weeks vacation to all the county staff that come to the board that aren't fully prepped and ready for vote with no financial impact. So you can't, as a county manager, he can't come to the Board of County Commissioners, ask for extra vacation time for staff without being able to present the financial impact of that. But how is that related to the LGBTQ question? I'm just saying that's what he does. He says, we don't have the ability to provide this information that you need to make this vote at this time. And we'll get back to you. Just like the things that he's brought up with the budget with the budget retreat. And just like that, we had to work five years to get $15 an hour for school personnel. Like it's taking too long to get these issues in front of the board. So again, the 15, I'm, I'm glad you referenced that. I used to work at Durham Public Schools for a while. And that $15 an hour, I've personally advocated for for years on public record, you can check the record. That's a policy decision. The school board could have made that policy decision long time ago. The county commissioners could have made that policy decision long time ago. The county employees are paid $15 an hour. That's a policy decision, right? So once again, the issue that I'm hearing is the People's Alliance have a problem with policy. That means that's the elected officials that you have the problem with. They, and our letter was addressed to the elected officials. Okay, but y'all made a, well, Next question. I think we're right at time. Um, and there's so many, so many other things that can be said. I hope that you all will, will be able to look at the chat, all three of you, and respond and type answers to that. Um, I wanted to close with this. I, what last statements do you all want to say to this audience of almost 200 people that are here listening to this town hall in respect to what's happening with this um, Mr. Wendell Davis situation? I really want to hear from you all. What things do you want to let everyone in the Durham community and abroad know? And I'll start with you, Millicent. So we want the people in Durham and the commissioners to understand that it's about moving policy positions. It's about aggressive tax relief for low-income, long-time residents. It's about 
fully funding for personnel and capitalist capital capital needs for public school systems. This is about um, making sure that the budgets are fair from a race equity standpoint. And this is about making sure that the contracts of the highest paid officials that work directly for the Board of County Commission are fair and equitable to the residents and taxpayers of Durham. Thank you, Melissa. I'll go to you next, Sheila. Um, thank you, LaShawn, for moderating this panel. I wanna say that first of all, and I'm glad to have been on this panel with the rest of you. So in terms of the Friends of Durham, one of the things that I think that um, is important for us to sort of leave you with is this sort of idea that, again, that Antonio hit on earlier, and that this is just not about one person. It just really isn't. And I keep hearing um, the term slow walk. And I actually worked in local government for a number of years. And when you're in that space and you're the one trying to do the research and trying to pull together the numbers and you have a number of priorities, it's not just one or two. I remember being in positions where I had 24 projects that I was working on at one time. And you have to understand that people are not trying to be the bad guy in this situation. And that a lot of times they are overworked, they have a lot of stress, and they are trying to do the job that they're trying to do. And it's not this sort of, well, I'm in the back room trying to find a way not to get this done. And so we need to keep in mind that when we have these conversations about our public employees, that it sends this message to them that is highly negative. And again, with these undertones of some of the phrasing that's used, like I said before, these sort of cat whistles that let people know what we're trying to say in a way that doesn't really come out and say what we all know it's saying, okay? When you're talking about how much a person is making and whether or not they're legitimately in that position. So I think we wanna make sure that we're having open dialogue, good conversations, and that we're doing it in a way that's not discriminatory and does not have these sort of racial undertones or overtones. And we're looking for a good government here. So we're looking to, to be able to make sure that all of our public employees are in a good work environment where they feel safe to be able to share what's going on. Thank you, Sheila. Antonio. So in terms of the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People, we value employees, we value black excellence, of course, and we value accountability in government. So regardless of your race of a county manager, city manager, police chief, those are things that we value. Now, as it relates to county employees, over 60% of them are people of color, employees of color, right? So we, we've heard from them, the things that they have experienced. Just on last night, like I said, the county commissioners moved to dismiss the entire county legal team in hopes to go find a contract review. When this same team review hundreds of millions of dollars of county contracts a year. Right, so I think those are some of the questions that we have to raise. Also, we have a county manager that is highly regarded in, in his in his space. That's that's a fact. That's and Antonio Jones didn't say that, but as a public administrator, what I know is that people go with their value. We've seen that in Durham already. So when we continue to allow our elected officials to disrespect our county employees, what we are sending to the next administrators is that don't come to Durham. If you're black, don't come to Durham if you unapologetically are good at what you do. Don't come to Durham, right? So we got to be careful about that. That's about holding people accountable. And also understand policy. If you have an issue with policies, go to the elected officials. If you have a problem with how policies are implemented, you talk to the administrator. Thank you so much, Antonio. And I want to thank all of you. And I want to take a, t the, a moment to recognize that this is all African-Americans on this panel that just had some really sharp disagreements that everyone was professional and everyone was able to really talk about these things. So I just wanna take a moment to recognize that, that it doesn't always have to be, you know, different folks in the room, we can do this together. So I'm really grateful that you all took the time to be on this panel. 
So with that, I guess, Henry, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And again, um, for the panelists, Melissa, Antonio, and Sheila, if you can take a look in the chat, or not the chat, the Q&A, because the chat is doing something um, that you may not want to see right now with some back and forth. But if you look in the Q&A, you can actually type an answer to some of these things that folks are bringing up. Well, look, I appreciate. Um, thank you, thank you, Lashawn, for 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 moderating it. Uh, thank you um, so much um, for for carrying through that conversation. Thank you, Millicent, for taking part in this um, in Durham, PA. Thank you, Sheila, for um, um, taking part in this um, uh, on behalf of Friends of Durham. Thank you, Antonio, for taking part in this on behalf of the Durham Community on Affairs of Black People. And so, uh, I, I think that you know this was a, a great conversation and, and one that needed to happen. And so. Um, appreciate that. Um, so if, if, if uh, I can uh, hold you guys for a little bit longer in terms of the overall audience, um, um, the panelists, you can um, um, go off the screen now. If I can hold you guys for a little bit um, longer. Um, I want to share um, a, a few more, um, uh, some, some context for you as, as we close out, because um, it was important for, I think, for this conversation to, to, to be had. Um, and you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, whether it's about race, whether it's not about race and, and, and things of that nature. And what I wanted to do was to, um, to actually um, kind of close us out. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, you know is it about Wendell Davis is about his, his slow walk policies, is it about this, is it about that. And so, you know, one of the things that, that, that um, you know, stuck out to me, um, um, Sheila, your camera's still on. Uh, uh, one of the things that one of the things that that, that um, you know st stuck out to me again, uh, you know, and, and folks may uh, disagree about this, but but part of it was really how um, you know um, you know some of this public dialogue went along. And so what I wanted to do was to kind of um, you know kind of have a, a follow up or, or, or a, uh, right after this panel and and just kind of share a few things and, and I wanted to kind of go through this and, and all of this is public data. So anybody who feels like that they want to go and, um, and kind of follow up um, behind, behind this, uh, feel free to do so, but there's a context for why I'm actually having this conversation. And so, um, you know, this idea of fact versus fiction and, and things of that nature. So the first thing I want to start out with was, um, you know, just looking at, um, you know, Mr. Davis's background, um, education as a BS and a BA. Um, both from North Carolina State University, he has a master's of urban planning. He has an MBA. Um, he also uh, did work at um, academic work at UNC Chapel Hill Institute of Government and County Administration and Public Executive Leadership. Um, he spent about 35 years in government industry, kind of progressively advancing from, you know, uh, first starting out. He's worked in a number of counties around the country, including uh, starting out in, in uh, you know, Illinois and Baltimore, um, a couple of counties in Virginia, Arlington and William, um, Bertie County here in North Carolina. He's been with Durham um, for uh, around 19 years um, in, in a couple of different roles. One is deputy um, manager for 12 years and his recent stint as, um, as um, you know, manager for the last seven years, he spent time as the uh, vice chancellor for administrative, administration and finance in North Carolina Central University. Found no kind of personal or professional incidents or, or, or indiscretions in, in kind of the public record. So that's just kind of the individual. Um, um, next, I, 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 again, this is all public data um, from a, a standpoint of, of, of accomplishments. Um, you know, seven consecutive years, consecutive years since he's been manager of clean audits, uh, consecutive, seven consecutive years of maintaining the county's AAA bond rating. And I know that came up a few times. We talk about that. Um, he secured the lowest uh, financing rate for any debt issue in the state of North Carolina um, at, at right around uh, 1.25, kind of all in. Uh, you know, there was some conversation in the chat about the, um, the minimum wage, but um, from what I know, he successfully worked with the Board of County Commissioners to be the first local government in the Southeast to move all county employees to $15 minimum wage. Uh, he successfully uh, worked with the Board of Commissioners to be amongst the first in the country to implement family and parental leave policy for new parents. Uh, again, you can look it up and kind of come back if you feel like that there's some discrepancy in this. Um, he implemented uh, President Obama's My Brother's Keeper program in Durham, which was among the first in the nation. Uh, when he entered it as the, uh, as the county manager in 2014, Durham's overall poverty rate was 18%, is currently at 14%. And over the last, um, you know, seven years, uh, we've seen um, somewhere around $3 billion in 
and uh, you know, close to 6,000 jobs has come in um, to the county. So that's kind of from a professional standpoint. Um, the public debate, um, there's been really kind of a couple of things that have been focused on the public debate. More recently, it's been around his contract, this idea that he has this kind of golden contract that pays him too much and that doesn't really hold him accountable and, and was instituted by and essentially a legitimate majority black board is kind of how, how it's framed. And reality is that, uh, again, feel free to look at this um, from what I can tell. His contract is actually modeled out the contract of the previous um, um, county manager um, who was white, Mike Ruffin, uh, and it actually was put in place by a majority white board to make it actually difficult for uh, him to be fired by the, um, you know, the, the, the folks that came after. And so, um, you know, when I see the, con I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, it's identical uh, essentially in, in, in the ways it's structured. And so, um, you know, that's something to, that, that is worth looking at. Um, also, um, the News Observer did an article uh, right after the, the, the public, um, the People's Alliance statement that indicated that, that actually, um, you know, though it was, there was sim simply, uh, or seemingly a big deal out of um, his contract that actually um, uh, Wendell Davis's contract wasn't out of line with, with other um, county managers in the triangle or across the state and, and somebody who, have, who has worked uh, across the country with, with local governments. Um, it's not out of line with, with any um, county officials. Um, and, you know, there's also this idea that somehow you, you know, he can't, he, he's not held accountable, but, but actually, again, um, similar to the previous contract, um, he can be fired for a cause, which means that if he does something that is for a cause that, that, uh, that is fireable, he can be fired. So, it is, the, you know, the statements publicly have made it sound like somehow he can't be held accountable, he can't be fired, but, but he can always be fired for cause. Uh, and again, that's identically structured from the previous white manager. And again, I think that part of what's saying here is that the, 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 the People's Alliance didn't make a statement about that uh, or about Mike Ruffin's contract at the time. And so, you know, is this equal um, kind of consideration for, for Wendell Davis? Second thing is, you know, of course, a lot of this conversation goes back to school funding and this, again, predates even the, um, the timeline I showed you earlier. The public frame has been that, that Wendell Davis is chronically underfunded schools, public schools, and does not really care about, you know, the 83% you know, kids of color in the school system and the schools are falling apart because of Davis. There was actually an article a couple of days ago in the News Observer that essentially um, said, you know, has some quotes about, about that. But you know, I, I looked. I went and did some research and, and looked at the um, the ten largest um, LEAs in North Carolina, the, the local education agencies, and, and actually Durham Public School ranks number one in the in the, in the uh, um, actually in, for the county funding for per average daily members at three thousand three hundred seventy six. Again, this is from the DPI um, data, so you free free to go look at it. That's thirty five percent more than the number two um, um, funder, which is Wake County. At only twenty five hundred dollars, and also again, I think that this was mentioned in the panel that the delay in capital improvement has been tied to issues outside the control of the county, um, and that was again um, even some of the previous county um, um, commissioners have admitted that. Um, and so anyway, there's a there's also I also looked at there's a slew of public information about DPS budget cuts and capital budget cuts that happened under the previous um, manager Mike Ruffin. Uh, uh, you know, if you look back to 2008, 2009, 2010, and there was there was not only se severe cuts, but also a raise in taxes, which obviously has an impact on the same families that, that are often criticized. And the question is, well, you know, I don't remember seeing a, a statement from the People's Alliance about that. And so the question is, you know, are these, you know, has the People's Alliance made any statements about kind of these issues in the past or is Mr. Davis' situation so unique that they felt like that they, that they had to come out with this public statement. I also wanna show this really quickly. Um, so this is, this is a 2020 resident survey, and this is not from you know, you know, even a year ago. This was released um, February of 2021. Again, this is public data. And I just wanna kind of quickly go through this. And so um, you know, it was done by a very reputable um, survey organization um, that, that, that works with organizations all across the or county governments all across the country. Um, the idea was to, to, to objectively assess resident satisfaction with delivery of county services, uh, and determine the priorities of the community, uh, measure trends from previous surveys, and compare the county performance with other similar sized cities. Um, so, in this survey, 81% um, of the of the uh, residents of Durham rated the county as excellent or a good place to live. Um, that's a simple, uh, very similar to what was done in 2019. 
Um, this ranks Durham County 16% above the average of other large communities across the United States. Uh, it's 29% above other large communities in terms of customer service from county employees. Uh, and also the community priorities over the next two years, um, public schools, maintenance, city streets, police protection, corresponding with the, the county priority over the next two years is public schools, sheriff protection, and public health services. And this is a, a survey that uh, has a confidence level of 95% and uh, representative of, of all Durham demographics. Um, and looking at it from a closer standpoint, in terms of places to live, places to work, places to visit, places to raise a child, places to retire and the community and whether the community is going in the right direction. A majority of Durham folks said that the county is, is doing right and, and, and 81% um, great place to live. Um, and these are significantly above um, other counties across the United States. Uh, I mean, significantly, you know, up to you know 30% uh, in some cases. And so uh, this, is, this came from the public uh, about their feeling about how, what, what's going on with Durham County. Uh, and looking at the, the, the response to the COVID-19, um, you know, this looked at all levels of government, the state government, the city government, the county government, the Durham Public Schools, and the federal government. Um, the county government rated better than any of the other uh, areas of government. Only 15% was dissatisfied, 16% from for was for the city government, and so on and forth. And so, even with the COVID response, the idea was that that the county government, um, you know, uh, performed um, and rate better than uh, any other um, group. And so the question that you know goes back to the earlier statement is um, you know uh, again this has been driven by this, this 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 statement that came out from the PA and and you know and and the question is is, is PA a friend or ally of the black of black Durham and who are they speaking for um, we we again we just saw the data in terms of in terms of what, what's going on with um with the county residents and how they feel about the community so um, the PA says that they believe in Durham that works for all um, the vision for a model progressive community. Uh, just an equitable, inclusive community where all people can thrive, um, and you know, work to advance the vision of Durham as a progressive community. And so, the question is: Is this the is this the actions of a progressive community? Um, I think another uh, question that comes up is: You know, uh, and this is broadly speaking, um, if something is done, uh, is it not kind of um, you know racially biased or racist because of who does it? So that that somebody who 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 has you know historically said that they've been associated with a group. Does that mean that that um, you know that they have a essentially kind of green light to, to 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 kind of enter into the conversation in ways that again feel like that they they have some some, some racial bias and so uh, I wanted to kind of finish out uh, with my with some final thoughts kind of where do we go from here um, you know with this idea that things aren't really necessarily always what they seem so this is from the same survey um, that um, that was done by Durham residents uh, when it looked at this question of you know, kind of, you know, race relations in Durham. And, and you see that, um, you know, nobody rated race relations in Durham as excellent or good from a majority of standpoint. Um, African-Americans rated, rated the least, uh, at only 30% uh, thought it was excellent or good, whereas 37% um, um, of white felt like it was, um, you know, excellent or good. And so you see a discrepancy in terms of, um, you know, how people uh, feel about uh, race relations in Durham. When you think about the idea of, of race, you know, progressing uh, kind of these, these um, um, this kind of work, uh, we see an even bigger discrepancy. Uh, only one percent more of, of Black folks in Durham thought that, that you know we were kind of heading the right right direction in terms of progressing along races, uh, dealing with kind of you know race. Whereas forty five percent of the whites almost half thought that we were. And so I think that speaks very loudly to this question of, you know, are we all seeing the same Durham. Um, you know, are we, do we all feel like that Durham is moving in the right direction uh, at the right pace? And so we see the African-Americans feel very differently um, than, the, than the white community. So to that end, I mean, there, there's work to be done. Um, and I, I think that for me, um, you know, folks say, well, you know, why did you enter into this conversation? And, and I've, I've said over and over again, I, I spent a lot of time talking about Durham. I spent a lot of time traveling across the country during regular COVID, uh, non-COVID times, talking about Durham as this progressive community progressive city that if there's anywhere racial equity can happen, it's in Durham. And so certainly uh, as we look at, look at this now, um, you know, the question is kind of where are we at? Um, and so I have people telling me, um, particularly white people telling me uh, as, you know, we're putting this on that they don't really have a dog in the fight that, you know, you know, why did they, why should they care? Or that this conversation made them uncomfortable and things of that nature. And so um, I don't really understand um, that, that language, right? This idea that, 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 you know, you don't have a dog in the fight. 
uh, first you live in Durham, right? And, uh, and, and the, the county manager is the CEO of Durham. Uh, overseeing the, the overall county. And so the idea that you don't have a, a dog in the fight just doesn't make sense to me uh, from that standpoint. Um, also, a, a lot of these same folks say that they care about equity, uh, particularly in Durham. And, uh, you know, no matter, I, I, I spend a lot of time talking with different, um, you know, white communities in Durham. I, I, I'm actually speak a lot, things of that nature. I can't find not one white person in Durham that says that they, you know, that they were for slavery, that they were for Jim Crow, that they were for, uh, you know, the, the highway coming through Haiti. Uh, and so my question is, well, I mean, well, you know, how do you voice in this moment in time, in this real life case of what's going on? Why do you sit out? Because people tend to have amnesia when they look back and they say, oh, well, look, you should have asked me, I would have joined into that conversation. So for me, uh, this is a critical conversation uh, about this. And in terms of the conversation about, um, you know, making you comfortable or not, I don't, I'm not sure that these conversations are supposed to be comfortable. And certainly if you feel uncomfortable having a conversation, how do you feel, how do you think it feels as a um, black professional individual always being at the center of these um, conversations? And then I say, finally, um, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to think about, um, you know, this work on a very national level, um, you know, um, as it says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So it doesn't matter whether you know Wendell Davis or not, it doesn't really matter whether you like Wendell Davis or not. I think that this is an important conversation as it relates to how um, you know public officials are treated, particularly specifically black public officials, um, and under what kind of um, you know conversation that's happening. So I think that that you know for me um, that's why this conversation was critically important. So kind of what are the next steps? Kind of what do we you know what do we need to do? Uh, I, I welcome you all to, to express yourself, right? I'm sure from the chat, some of you, you know, agree with the, you know, the, the idea of supporting uh, Manager Davis. I know some of you uh, agree with the idea of him uh, not being supported. So I say contact your county commissioners directly. I mean, you know, you can go out and, and Google Durham County Commissioners, find anybody, email address, and just, you know, let them know how you feel uh, from that standpoint. So I do believe in that kind of representative conversation. Second is, uh, you know, go to racialequitytalks.org um, and take the polis poll. Um, you know, I know Greg. Uh, has been sharing this in the chat and, and I know there's some conversations going on. Go out there and vote on these different statements that are out there, put your own statement and let's see kind of how people are feeling about this. I'm sure that you have, you know, particular feelings after this conversation. So, you know, I'm not telling you how to vote, how to, how to um, think, go out there and, and let's see kind of what the community comes up with. Uh, and then also as a part of this, you know, uh, I, I certainly won't um, either suggest future, um, you know, racial equity talks, not only here in Durham, uh, but also nationally. So, so there's two platforms here. One is a national racial equity talks uh, platform. And, and the second one, because I'm in Durham is one just for Durham. I think it's important that these conversations happen and that they happen, happen in real time and they happen with real voices from the community. So I encourage you to go out to the website and, uh, and, and, and engage in that way. You probably see this, you probably think that this is kind of weird. I got this Raising the Sun um, slide up here. Uh, most of you know the Raising the Sun, the great play by uh, Lorraine Hansberry. And so I, I put this up there because as part of these racial equity talks, not only are we gonna have these town hall conversations that are gonna be recorded and, and, and kept on record, all of you should, uh, you know, everybody that registered for this, all 355 people will get a copy of this, um, of this um, video recording um, when it's ready. But also there will be a follow-up case study uh, for each of these conversations. And so North Carolina Central University where I teach at and, and Harvard University will partner on, um, on doing case studies um, based on these where we try to dig in deeper and, and, and kind of, again, see what's going on with the case. And so there will be a case study for the case for or against Wendell um, Davis that will um, um, come up. And the reason I put the Raising the Sun um, uh, post up there is, is, is for this reason. If you've seen the movie, um, with, you know, City Party A, Ruby D, great movie. There's a scene at the end of the movie where, um, you know, the, the, the storylines where the, the white um, uh, community that the, the black family wants to move into has raised money to actually buy, the, the, to give money to the black community and say, don't move into the community. We will pay you to stay where you are and not move into the community. And the, at first the, the, the family rebuffs them, but then because of some actions of Sidney Poitier's character, uh, he needs the money. He calls the white guy over and say, okay, we're ready to take your money not to go into your community. And there's a scene in there where, um, you know, um, the white man comes over and Cindy Poitier, they're ready to do the transaction. And the mother, the, the Cindy Poitier's mother, um, you know, what Cindy Poitier tells his son, his young son, go out, you go outside and play, um, you know, while we conduct this business. And then the grandmother says, no, don't go out. 
I need you to stay right here. And, and basically she says, teach him and show him, um, help him understand what you're doing. And so the reason why we're doing this case study is because we want, we want the students from Harvard, we want the students from NCCU to take a look at these issues around racial equity in these communities. And, and we, that's very intentional. Um, we, I want young people to take a lead in this. I want them to um, you know, understand what's going on here because we as adults say a lot of things that we don't necessarily follow through on. And we need to teach them, we need to help them understand when we look at these racial equity, equity issues, what's really going on. You know, are we saying and doing two different things? And so these, we're gonna have our students dig into this and, you know, and, and, and see what they find. Um, especially as we now in this, this world of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Everybody wants to, wants to you know, say that they're about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and so we're gonna, we're gonna put that to the test and we're gonna have our students uh, research this and put out case studies so these things become permanent record. Um, it's one thing to say something, it's another thing to actually have it on record for permanent so that these case studies will be, will be um, you know, studied by governments across the United States and governments across the world. And so that's what we're gonna do as we move um, out of here. And so the question is, what will these students see? Um, you know, will, will they be proud of what they see from, from us? Will they see equity at the end of the day? And so I want to I want to kind of finish up uh, with with a, a, a couple of things. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I teach at North Carolina Central University, which is a historically black college. Uh, I, I teach young people, and I have a program that works with honor students. And I and I, and I always ask the students, you know, these kind of same questions. You know, what made you come to NCCU, and uh, you know, and kind of where do you want to go in life? I mean, tell me that. And I, I want to kind of point out two responses that came to me from students that I thought was was pretty pronounced. One was to the question of why did you come to NCCU, young black female who um, actually graduated high school when she was uh, like 16. She could have went anywhere she wanted to. She said that I wanted to come here because I didn't want to have to think about being black. And, you know, she said, I just wanted to be black. I didn't want to have to think about it. And so I didn't, I didn't want to go to a place where I have to always think about being black. Uh, uh, and I thought that was a pretty powerful statement about this idea of, of always having to be conscious of of, of who you are in, in, in these, these other spaces. Um, I asked a, a black male gave me an answer to the second one that I thought was profound, which is, you know, what do you want in life? I asked, what do you want in life? And I'm, you know, other students are saying, you know, I want to go work here. I want to go work there. I want to do this. I want to travel here. He started, he started, he just stopped and he started thinking. He said, um, he said freedom. And that's all he could, could say was freedom. He just kept saying freedom over and over again, freedom. And he couldn't really expound on that. But you know, the truth is I actually understood what he meant. He wanted the freedom. Uh, he wanted the, the idea of a freedom of being a black man. And so I think that's important to, to, to really, um, you know, think about that. And, and, and so for all of those who talk about per pupil spending and, and, and you know, as, as being kind of the, you know, it's all about per pupil spending or it's the, the only thing that, you know, you know, is focused on education. I wanna say it's certainly important. I mean, education investment is incredibly important. I went to public schools, my wife went to public schools, my kids both went to public schools, my wife's a public school teacher. Um, so it's incredibly important. But, but trust me, I know a whole lot of individuals, uh, black individuals who are very highly educated, who are very underemployed or unemployed. And so I think that that's important. And, and also, trust me, when I deal with these students, they see what's going on around them. And so, you know, they see, they've seen their parents, they've seen their, their grandparents, they've seen others who have did all the right things, right? They've stayed out of trouble. They've gotten all the right education degrees and, and credentials. Um, they've done the experience, they got the hard work, they worked their way up, they've committed to work, yet only to be torn apart, um, you know, because they made some white person mad at work or on some area. And so they see this. And so in a lot of ways, they're asking the question, why bother? Why do I, why do I go through all of this if at the end of the day, it's going to just essentially be torn apart because somebody, um, you know, gets upset with me. And so, again, we have to have a change in culture. And at the end of the day, um, they're watching us. And so we, you know, we need to take that into account that, is, that, that there's things that go beyond simply the idea of how much goes into an education budget is, is these other things as well. And until we address these broader things, then, you know, we're going to have to deal with that. And so, uh, I, I want to finish up. Uh, my wife and I watched a couple of weeks ago um, the this, the United States versus Billy Holiday, an incredible movie. And something struck me as I was sitting there uh, watching the movie. There's been a big debate about this conversation with, with um, you know Wendell Davis, uh, you know the use of the term professional lynching and and, and whether that was disrespectful and things of that nature. 
And so, you know, uh, you know, and, and as I was watching the, the, the United States versus Billie Holiday, what struck me was, you know, that they spent, the FBI spent all this time following her, um, you know, really wreaking havoc on her life because they didn't want her to sing the song Strange Fruit, uh, particularly in the South, because they thought it would, would create a riot of people responding and, and, and going out. And so they, but she, she was brave enough to continue to, see, to sing it. Uh, and so it, it struck me that really, you know, we're not in a world of strange fruit. I mean, we're in a world of strange orchards, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's strange fruit, all kinds of ways that lynching the body was certainly one and is one kind of way of, of you know, uh, killing the body. But how many ways can you kill a black body? Um, you know, what do you call it when you kill a person's spirit or their dreams or their career or their hope or their aspiration or their future? I mean, you know, isn't that murder? Uh, you know, isn't that a lynching? And so I, I think it's important for us to, to really understand that. And especially when it's done in a way that is that almost holds it up for public to see, right? Um, that, you know, sometimes does things in the dark, but then holds it up in the public and says, hey, I want you to look at this. And this is a warning to you um, about what might happen to you if you don't walk a fine line or stay in your place. And so I think that's important that, that we be very conscious about what's going on. And so the question is, you know, are white liberals really cherry picking, um, you know, kind of from the fruits that they want to address? I mean, certainly George Floyd's and the situation in Elizabeth City, all these things are critically important. And we have to point this out because killing the unarmed black people has just got to stop. Uh, but what about all the other things? I mean, there's all these things that come together again. Um, leaders around the country always ask me, well, you know, what are the one or two things here that we should be doing to address these issues of, of inequities? And I say, look, Mayor, uh, it wasn't one of two things that got us here. And it's not gonna be one of two things that gets us out of here. And so it's, it's all these things together. And so we need to look at this orchard of, of, of strange fruit trees and figure out how do we get through that? And we need our, our friends or allies to stop cherry picking the things that they think are worthy of their attention and look at it from a holistic standpoint. So my, the, kind of finally, um, I want to have this town hall to talk about accountability versus justice, right? I mean, that's a, that's a, in my mind, a, a key distinction. Um, you know, the question is what has Wendell Davis done or not done to lose his job? I think for me, that's a, a key question. And again, I don't want to talk about, you know, necessarily his salary, salary or benefits package again, especially when it's tied to, uh, you know, when, when it's comparable to, to others, right? Uh, I, I don't really want to talk about, you know, some of the, the, the voting records again, because the Board of County Commissioners votes on policy and they can put things on the agenda. So I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that. Um, I don't want to talk about, you know, kind of what the board composition of that, that was made of when he got put in, in, um, in that position in the PA statement, it made a statement that there's only one um, county commissioner remaining on the board who supported that contract. What it didn't say was there's only one county commissioner remaining on the board that didn't support the contract. Um, so why, you know, so, so let's be fair in this. What I really want to talk about is what is his record as county manager? I mean, that's the question for me. Uh, and so for me, we have to have accountability to our public leaders, our elected leaders, uh, you know, and, and, and understand one of the things, you know, whether people are trying to address personal issues or, or grievances or, you know, single issue causes or, you know, really what's going on here. Because if these things aren't checked in the community and they're allowed to go and check, then it will, uh, you know, reverberate for years to come. And so I think it's important that we um, you know, check these things uh, uh, right now. And at the end of the day, uh, the demand is simple. Um, uh, all we want is to stop killing us um, in all the ways that you do uh, with all these kind of strange fruits. So I want to thank you all for being a part of this uh, racial equity talk. I want to thank the, the, the more than 100 people or so that have stayed with us throughout this whole time. Please go to racialequitytalks.org and, uh, and take part in the, in the poll. Let us know how you feel. Let us know what, what you want to hear about. And, uh, and, and um, that concludes um, you know, my conversation. And uh, uh, thank you all for, for being a part of this.